February, our career month, we have um, various panels for you. Uh, today we have the Urban Tech Startups panel, and um, I will just briefly introduce uh, Stephen Larrick, and then he will kind of just take it away. Stephen is the city success lead at Stay, and has previously been uh, an urban planner himself for the city of Central Falls, Rhode Island. Central Falls, Rhode Island. <laughs> um, so with that, um, let's welcome our Urban Tech panel for today. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Stephen Larrick, as Wen Fei uh, said in the warm introduction. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you to today's panel. Um, I'm going to be your moderator and facilitator and guide for the next hour and a half. Um, and today we're going to be tackling a theme near and dear to my heart, a theme that connects technology and planning to questions of governance, money, power and influence, uh, to data and data collection, issues of privacy, um, and to the, at, a, at a macro level to questions about the future of cities and ultimately who gets to decide that future. Uh, this theme, of course, that connects to all these topics um, is that of the rise of the urban tech startup. For me, this is a conversation um, that I'm excited to be moderating, not just uh, for professional or academic reasons, um, but this is a conversation that's personal to me. Um, when I worked, as Wenfei mentioned, as a city planner, um, getting my start in the city of Central Falls, Rhode Island, um, this was a small post-industrial city hit hard by the financial crisis and facing extreme uh, fiscal hardship. Uh, during that time, uh, we worked with urban tech startups uh, to help out. Uh, when I worked at the Sunlight Foundation, leading our city's team as an open data advocate and advisor to city halls across the US, my work focused in part on helping city halls make sense of new data sources and new technological realities often, often shepherded in by urban tech startups, often not necessarily on the timeline of the city officials I was advising. Um, and for the past year and a half now, after working at the intersection of city making and technology in the public and nonprofit sectors for nearly a decade, I myself have made the jump and now work at an urban tech startup. It's called Stay, I'm our city success lead, and I support uh, API management and civic data collaboration projects with local governments across the country. Before we dive into introducing our panelists, I'm going to preface this discussion by saying a few words, um, probably uncontroversial uncon words for, for urban planning students like yourselves, on city making. Um, so city making, by which I mean the production of urban space, both social and physical, is and has always been multilateral. This is not new. The public sector, the state, has, has played a role in governance, creating policy, planning, public works projects, building housing um, and infrastructure, and in governance itself. Private sector developers construct the physical realities on, on private parcels in the city, and the private sector as a whole produces jobs, goods and services that make urban economies remote. Nonprofit organizations in turn provide human services and programs, advocate for change, and they support art and culture, all of which connects us to a city's sense of place. But increasingly in the past decade or so, we've seen the emergence of a new city making actor the urban tech startup. And so the question before us today is how does the urban tech startup fit into? this ecosystem of city-making actors, this multilateral process of city-making. Today we're going to explore, here are our panelists for today. Um, we're all going to help uh, kind of address and explore these topics. And today we're going to explore this, this broad question um, of what does it mean, uh, for, what does the rise of the urban tech startup mean both in, in literal terms, what's the real lived experience of city officials and of folks working in urban tech startups? What are the real projects in, in a nuts and bolts sense? Um, and also theoretically, what are the implications um, morally, ethically, um, what are the implications for governance 
what are the implications for the future, and who gets to decide that future. So to kind of sum that up, I'm, I, I want to um, give us kind of a north star for our conversation today, and that is the question you see before you, what is the evolving role of urban tech startups in serving urban communities and shaping urban policy and space? And what should it be? And we couldn't have a better panel of experts to help us navigate these complex issues. Um, so without further ado, let's start it up, no pun intended. Um, here are our panelists. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you who each panelist is uh, in, in, in a few brief words. Um, and then I'm gonna let them, I'm gonna prompt them with three questions. Um, they'll have three minutes each. No, no strict timekeeping, but uh, <laughs> three minutes each before I yank you off stage, um, to tell, tell, tell you a little bit more about themselves and their background um, before we get into the conversation. Um, those three questions are, how did you get involved in the urban tech startup world? What is your company's work or mission? And then, how does that mission of your company or how does your personal background uh, relate to today's theme? So, we'll take it one by one. Um, starting us off is Nusha, and I'm going to butcher this, Gailey. Perfect. Um, Nusha has a background in architecture. Um, she had previously worked as a researcher and instructor at the Sensible Cities Lab at MIT, um, and is now the president and co-founder of Biobot Analytics. Uh, she is the only found, sort of founder on our panel today, so she's going to be representing an important perspective. Um, and with that, I will kick it off to Nusha to uh, briefly tackle those three questions. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, Wednesday, Stephen. Um, and I, I'll start by talking about what the mission of BioBot is and then sort of how I got involved, um, kind of my path, and then end with the last question, the third one. Um, so Biobot Analytics, what we do is we develop technology to extract information on human health from sewage uh, in order to map population health in cities. So if you think about the fact that um, our urine has a lot of information on our health and well-being, our doctors are looking at it all the time, we uh, adapt urine and stool analysis to look at city sewage. So essentially being able to understand the health of entire cities and communities to be able to respond to public health threats and public health emergencies. Um, so the mission of BioBot is really a future where we don't have public health emergencies, and this is a very timely issue right now, but where we don't have public health emergencies sort of creeping up on us and that we're able to catch them before they become epidemics and be able to um, have coordinated government response before they become epidemics. Um, so I started uh, working on BioBot about six years ago when I first went to MIT. Um, I trained as an architect. I studied architecture in Canada, where I'm originally from, at the University of Waterloo, um, where I did my undergrad. And then in my master's thesis work, I started to really focus on the urban scale and understanding how we can leverage digital technologies and sensors in order to build more resilient cities and communities. At the time, I was specifically focused on climate change resilience, um, coastal resilience, sea level, sea level rise, et cetera. And then with that work, I came down to MIT because the Sensible City Lab is a group um, within the School of Ur Urban Studies and Planning where they do a lot of that research. And on my first day at the lab, I met who is now my co-founder. Um, she was a PhD student in computational biology that was essentially looking at the science and the technology behind measuring human viruses and chemicals in sewage. Um, had no idea whether there's, there would be, you know, uh, uh, like what the implications of this would be for urban management or urban design, um, but just from a technical perspective was really excited about that question. And so we started working together for about three years on the research, the foundational research, um, started the company three years after, so now that's two years ago. Um, went to Y Combinator, did the sort of traditional startup, tech startup route, raised some seed funding, and now here we are, um, deployed across seven cities in the US today. Um, and so how I think we fit into this broader conversation of urban tech startups and um, you know, uh, what position they should take, and this is actually a question that we've grappled with a lot, 
um, when we first started as a company, uh, we felt that we had two routes that we could take as a startup, as a tech startup working with cities. One is a little bit more of like an aggressive route, which I would say companies like Uber and Airbnb have taken, which is let's just deploy in, in the face of regulation and sort of deal with the consequences later. Raise a whole bunch of venture money, for example, and be able to buy our way out of a lot of the, the kind of hurdles, regulatory hurdles that we, that we face. We very deliberately chose another route, which um, meant slower growth for us because we wanted to really align ourselves with um, the cities that we were working with and specifically with what the government wanted. Um, yeah, I'm happy to dive into that later, but it's just a little synopsis. Thank you so much, Nisha. Um, next, we have Matthew, and again, probably I will butcher. Go for it. Bouchard? Hold on. Two for two. Um, from Remix, he's an exec account executive at Remix. Uh, Matthew, uh, like you, has a background uh, in urban planning. Um, and prior to that, he, he kind of got started in the tech world working in financial software at Bloomberg LP. Um, decided he wanted to make a change uh, and kind of get more civically involved. Um, got his MEP from Hunter College. Uh, in transportation, with a focus on transportation. Um, and now he works at the transportation uh, technology startup, Remix. Um, so I'll hand it over to Matthew, um, who can say a little bit more about uh, those three key questions, uh, which if I'm remembering correctly, are how did you get involved, um, what is the mission of your company, and how, does, how do either of those things relate to the theme? Cool. Well, um, hello everyone. Really excited to be here. Um, I'll start with um, kind of how I got here today. So. Um, you know, Stephen mentioned my background. I uh, started really the first almost decade of my career working at Bloomberg LP, um, mostly on software um, and doing really client-facing stuff and sales account management. Um, but about, I would say, midway through my time there, I realized that um, I really didn't like finance and that I wanted to do something else with my life. Um, and I sort of picked urban planning because it really was the convergence of sort of a lot of passions, whether it's policy, or cities, or transportation, how people move, and um, so I decided to go back to uh, school for a master in planning at Hunter College. Um, and it was at Hunter College that I realized that um, urban planners really don't have, um, you know, the wealth of resources technologically um, that folks in other industries do, like finance. Um, and so I was able really to see this contrast between, you know, the resources that folks in finance have to solve problems and the resources we have. Um, it sort of got me thinking, well, what sort of careers are available in technology to really support urban planners? Um, at the time, I didn't really, I couldn't really find any companies that were um, truly doing that. This was about five, six years ago, and sort of the small startups, uh, tech start, urban tech startups were still starting to emerge, and I thought I was going to just, um, you know, join an agency or a DOT or something like that. Um, and then I happened to find Remix, and Remix really is um, the convergence of technology and urban planning, um, really, you know, all of the work that uh, everyone does in this room. Um, and so a little bit about sort of what we do. Um, we're a platform for bringing the transportation picture together for uh, transit agencies, but also departments of transportation. Um, and so our four co-founders got their start at the civic nonprofit uh, Code for America five years ago. Um, they were paired with a bunch of cities, and they decided to work on this prototype where you could essentially draw a line um, on a map and plan bus lines basically instantly. Um, and so they worked on this for about a year. Um, they didn't, weren't too sure what they were going to do with it after the program. Um, but then, you know, all of a sudden overnight, word sort of got around the internet and Oregon Department of Transportation reached out to them and they said, you know, where can we, where can we send the check to, to, to buy the service? Um, and so uh, that's kind of how Remix was born. And really over the last five years, we've uh, grown to work with about 325 agencies and, and cities across the world. Um, and really our mission is, you know, broadly speaking, to make more livable cities, but more sort of focused. It's really to provide transportation planners with uh, the resources they honestly really deserve to be able to plan safer, more equitable and accessible cities. Um, and so um, I take, I guess, a little bit more narrow view of urban tech in uh, planning and transportation. Um, kind of given my two backgrounds in that um, I think there's a real role for um, tech companies to play in, in supporting 
transportation planners in doing what they do best, which is uh, planning cities, reaching out to communities, and really understanding what folks need to um, you know, build better cities for everyone. That's great. Thank you, Matt. And I think we're seeing already some, some kind of building of, of themes here um, with this kind of distinction between urban technology that supports government versus urban technology that disrupts government. Um, maybe we can talk about gov tech versus urban tech, um, this kind of broader umbrella. Um, and and uh, I think we're also seeing something that might be a helpful lens to bring the conversation, um, which is the different scales that ur urban tech is not a monolith. Um, we have smaller companies uh, like Stay or, or like Biobot that are working with um, you know, a, 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 a a under a dozen cities. Um, and then we have uh, startups that are, that are further along in their journey. Um, and how many did you say Remix is working with now? Uh, we're 325. 325 globally. Yeah. Um, great, so uh, uh, excited to kind of introduce our next Leg of the panel, just who arrived just in time. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> were you having curb issues? I don't know how you got here. It's my own fault. Your own fault. Okay. <laughs> I had I had trouble finding it. I feel like we have this urban startup <laughs> issue of we got to integrate campus map data with 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 uh, route planning there map we data. Try <laughs> to enter off of Amsterdam. Um, so next on our panel is Don Miller, who is the Head of Policy and Partnerships at CORD. Um, Don brings a really unique uh, perspective and background to this panel. Um, as, uh, in addition to myself, the, the other panelist who has worked directly for uh, municipal government um, at the Taxi and Limousine Commission for the City of New York. Um, and. Uh, Something that is remarkable about Don's, uh, in terms of uh, connection to our theme for today, about Don's uh, perspective, er, perspective and experience is that she, uh, during her time um, at TLC, she was uh, heavily involved in regulating um, some disruptive urban tech startups, um, namely Uber and Lyft, and TNCs generally, here in, in the city of New York. Um, so I think Don's got this perspective as someone who's worked on both sides of this equation. Um, prior to working for TLC and prior to joining CORD, um, uh, Dawn received her, has a background in, in public administration with an MPA from Princeton and a BA from UVA. And Dawn, you missed it, but <laughs> what we're doing is uh, every panel member is answering the same three questions um, as a means of introducing themselves to the room. Uh, those questions are, how did you get your start? in urban technology? What is the mission of the company you work for? And how does your background in urban tech and or the m mission of your company relate to today's theme? Great. Um, so thanks everyone for, for coming today. Um, my name is Dawn Miller um, and I, um, I've been interested in kind of planning for a long time. I was lucky enough that my undergrad had a program so I got to minor in urban planning in undergrad and was kind of on this path for a while. And when I went um, to grad school, I was kind of sitting um, in New Jersey, like watching a lot of interesting urban policy coming out of the Bloomberg administration and was very interested in um, going to work for the city of New York. Um, I was kind of looking at the agencies you might imagine, DOT, city planning, um, DEP, um, and then got a call from TLC, what's that? Um, and kind of the rest the rest was history. And um, it was always a kind of an active regulatory agency, but there was definitely a, a, the greatest focus on the yellow taxi industry. Um, then obviously that changed when Uber and Lyft arrived. And so um, it became actually like a, a super ex exciting place to be, um, where um, kind of every opportunity and challenge that hits the country, hits New York biggest and hardest. Um, but New York was uniquely positioned that we had such strong regulatory authority, so we were able to really um, design a kind of a lot of first of its type regulation because the world was still figuring out like what what does it mean to regulate these companies. Um, and as you may imagine, it was it was extremely contentious. Um, there was a lot of litigation. There were protests. There were I don't know crazy PR campaigns and all of that stuff. Um, but even behind the scenes in those, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings with the companies, there was a lot of, like, 
not speaking the same language um, and, and things that could have gone better than they did. Um, but for the approach that the, that the companies took to the issue that I think was partially a function of, especially in their earlier days, not having as much staff who had a policy planning or government background. So I kind of had it somewhere in the back of my head that the next thing I might want to do would be to um, make those conversations work better. Um, so then I, when I was actually at the point, you know, I was, I was at TLC for nine years. Um, so when I was at the point where I was ready to leave, I was kind of looking at a lot of tech companies and was, um, was very kind of choosy about the ones I would want to work for because I think I, I knew so much about what they were really doing in a way that you don't, if you're just, even if you're like a voracious news consumer, you don't know as much as if you're kind of in the trenches of these conversations. So um, I wanted to, to join the tech side, but at a place that really aligned with kind of like my personal values and mission. Um, and companies like Remix, I came across at TLC and I started to see there's this kind of set of companies that I think are doing things um, that are supporting the work of cities, um, which is ultimately representing the people. Um, and um, having worked, you know, on ride hailing and taxi, um, curb space issues were a, an increasing issue um, in terms of safety and congestion. Um, so, and, and so that was kind of what brought me to CORD. Uh, CORD is um, an online platform to help cities better manage their, their curb space because it's, it's always been an issue and a contentious issue in cities, but it's gotten that much worse with ride hailing, with e-commerce, um, with uh, micromobility, and with the realization among more and more cities that car parking isn't always the best use of this valuable urban space. Um, so we provide data collection and analytics tools and then um, programs to help cities more actively actually operate and change the behavior of, of drivers, especially fleets, on their street. Um, how does this relate to the topic? I don't know if there's anything more to say, <laughs> um, except I, I think I, I was on the government path my whole life. Like, I mean, I, I declared a major in poli sci when I was 12. So I think I did not have a lot of um, background in, in business or understanding of, I knew these were like startups, but like I didn't really like know why they did what they did and how that related to their business models. So I think that's um, information that I gained over time that helps me kind of, has helped me understand why some of those tensions exist. I don't have the magical solution, but um, it helped me understand um, why government and its pace of, of change is, is often incompatible with the pressures that, um, that people running companies based on venture backing are facing from their investors. Thank you so much, Don. I think, again, building on um, some of the, the things we have emerged here in the conversation already, um, we have this idea of incentives that can be aligned with the public interest, as well as incentives that are misaligned with the public interest, and what's the role of regulation and, and kind of correcting that gap. And speaking of those incentives, mm -hmm. Um, thrilled to introduce our, our final panelist for today, uh, Liz Sisson. 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 Sorry to mess Two up out of here. Three. Yeah. Okay. Um, who is the COO of Urban Us? Urban Us. Urban. Don't Urban you? Us. Okay. Urban Us. Investor. Um, <laughs> Liz represents the investment and financing side of things as, as Urban Us is an investor in uh, the urban tech startup ecosystem. Um, and uh, I think we'll bring that critical perspective to the conversation. Um, prior to joining um, Urban Us, uh, Liz has a background in public policy and specifically leading local initiatives across the country at the Roosevelt Institute, a think tank. Um, Liz has also consulted for local government around a variety of issues, um, including uh, environmental issues, etc. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Liz. Thank you. To answer thank you all your questions. Yeah, thank you all for being here. 
Um, you did a great job with the background. Um, yeah, so I started off my career doing some consulting for transportation and environmental through state governments. Um, I ended up at the Roosevelt Institute doing some policy research. I loved policy. Uh, the 2016 election kind of messed me up a little. Um, and um, sort of took a few steps back and thinking about sort of impact and change and um, sort of what happens when you have a lot of resources and sort of how that, how you can carry out change with a lot of resources. So I think similar to a lot of folks on the stage, I sort of wanted to give the tech space a try um, and thinking about how when tech is implemented without someone that understands policy, doesn't understand marginalized communities, doesn't understand like long term, um, how dangerous that could be. So um, I sort of wanted to get in the inside and see what happens with you know venture capital and what happens when you make investments in, in um, technology that a lot of VCs frankly don't have that knowledge. So um, I joined Urbanos about three years ago. Uh, like I said, we're a VC group that invests in urban tech. So we focus on food, water, waste, energy, transportation, built environment, civ tech, gov tech, resiliency. I think I got them all. Um, and so basically any, any city functions, we don't do uh, healthcare and we don't do education. Um, we do feel like those are definitely government uh, responsibility. So um, we also run a startup accelerator called Urban X, and that is in partnership with BMW Mini, and we invest in the same uh, spaces that I just noted. Uh, slightly smaller checks, and we work more intimately with the startup. So it's a program for five months, um, and we help with product market fit, we help with regulatory issues, we help with product, we help with fundraising, in the hope to get all those teams to a seed, seed plus, series A investing at the end of the program. Um, the mission for us is, it started as, and it is right now, so a common theme is combating climate change and thinking about how cities play a huge factor in climate change. Um, not just causing it, but also the mitigation side of it as well. And, you know, thinking about ever-increasing urbanization and the issues that happen with density and sort of how can startups work alongside the government, kind of going back to what we were just talking about. We are not the VC that wants to fight against. We're the VC that wants to work with. Um, but how can, how can startups sit with the government to figure out all of these issues? Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't think I have to explain any more about how, urban, how this pulls back to urban tech because that's literally all we do, but um, yeah. Thank you so much, Liz. And um, full disclosure, uh, so Stay was a, a graduate of Urban X, um, as I believe was Cord. Cord and, was an investment oh, Cord, outside oh, of investment Urban Investment outside X, yeah. of, okay, and, and Remix as well? Or, no, okay. Didn't want to make things awkward, but wanted to get things out there. <laughs> um, that said, that doesn't mean I'm gonna not hold Liz's feet to the fire. Uh, we are moderate. not investors in yeah, Stay, though, right. so. Yeah. <laughs> Before our time. <laughs> Um, but as I mentioned, so we're seeing uh, some other key points that I think can help inform this conversation, um, including this idea of, of kind of what's an investment thesis and how, you know, how does that play into how startups grow and the types of things that we see as apps on our phone or that the options that we have as consumers or that our governments have as civil servants. Um, and I think it'll be really great to kind of have this interplay between the startups represent here and someone on the, on the kind of the uh, investment side of things as well. Um, and then finally, one thing I'm noticing is everyone here seems to work for a company that has this, let's work with government rather than disrupt government approach. Um, so we may have to think about how to play devil's advocate at certain parts of this conversation. Speaking of the conversation, oh, and hello everyone, my name is Stephen Larrick, I'm moderator, it's <laughs> only fair uh, that I answer the same three questions that I post to everyone else. Um, I said a little bit about my background, but um, you know, my, my, I think my first foray into urban technology uh, was academic. Um, I did a capstone project on what at the time was the IBM Smarter Cities Challenge in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, really interested in what is this. Um, it turned out it wasn't, it didn't seem to be a whole lot, uh, but there were some interesting ideas being explored. I wrote a thing about, you know, that how it related to Lefebvre. You guys know. Um, and from there, I became a city planner. And as I mentioned, uh, we were a really under-resourced department. Um, and so it was really helpful for us to form partnerships, whether that, that was with our local Code for America brigade uh, in Rhode Island, adorably called uh, Code Island, um, or whether it was with um, 
technologists who, who came in as, as, as interns and helped us digitize our zoning map for the first time, um, or, and, and publish our parcel data as open data for the first time, um, or whether it was with uh, full-on civic technology startups um, who helped us map and inventory our real property portfolio um, and put it online as a, flat, uh, as a map that, that uh, supported ideation from uh, our scissory uh, in terms of, you know, hey, we, we all own this together, what should we do with it? Um, from there, I started working at the Sunlight Foundation, um, where I led our local government team that was specifically focused on supporting city halls through an initiative called What Works Cities, um, funded by Google Philanthropies. Um, Sunlight was kind of doing civic technology before it was called that. Uh, we had a, we had a, we were a nonprofit that also had a, a unit called Sun, Sunlight Labs um, that was kind of working both in. Uh, both in ways that were antagonistically holding government accountable, as well as in ways that were meant to support the important public interest work that government does. Um, a lot of that antagonistic work was work that was supporting journalists um, in terms of getting access to information. Um, and uh, after, after eight years working in the, in the public and nonprofit sector, um, in 2018 I, I made the leap and I started working for STAY. Um, I think, you know, at its uh, at, at the heart of, of Stay's bet is this idea that um, with the rise of urban technology has also uh, risen an asymmetry of, uh, of power and, and maybe, maybe I should say of, of information technology and as a result an asymmetry of power, at least a shift in the power dynamic and how might we empower government with the infrastructure needed um, for a more level playing field. Um, as, as kind of the different sectors navigate uh, this new world and, and, and um, kind of need to play their core functions of governance, etc. Um, so I'm going to be bringing that perspective to how I moderate this panel. And um, I think the first thing I want to uh, put out there as kind of a value is that um, panels like cities um, offer something to everyone if, uh, if and because uh, everyone contributes to them or whatever the code is. Um, so what I'm saying is, uh, let's make this particip participatory. Um, as the moderator, I, I hope I can be a good representative of your intellectual curiosity. But if there's something urgent that you that, that sparks um, from the conversation, raise your hand, and we'll see if we can get it incorporated in. Um, actually, you know, show of hands, who here um, has a background in urban planning? So what I'm saying is, all of you have something valuable to add to this conversation. Um, so don't be shy. Um, we will have a dedicated time at the end of the discussion for audience questions, but like I said, let's, let's make it participatory. Um, and now that we've done the background, we're going to try to also keep it free-flowing and organic. Um, we just kind of went down the line and everybody introduced themselves, um, but conversations don't work that way. Cities don't always work according to plan either. Um, so we're going to jump, jump around uh, and I'll try to helpfully nudge and jump into direct. Um, so here we go. I want to start us off kind of um, with an existential question, which is, what, what is urban tech? What are we talking about when we talk about urban technology and urban technology startups? Um, and what is it not? And uh, I think this is important just to start the conversation with a common understanding of what we're even talking about. Um, so I, I wonder if anyone on the panel has, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, I do I want to get it out of the way. And I wonder if anyone on the panel has a thought of what it is, and then I, I'll wonder if anyone on the panel um, ha, has, has a different thought of what it is, and isn't. And I know, uh, Liz, that you had kind of uh, chimed in about this, this idea uh, early on as we were, we were kind of ideating on this panel. Yeah, um, I can let me work backwards and say what it's not, um, just because I think probably people have a good idea of what it is. Um, so I think there's a lot of misconceptions about where, what urban tech is um, in saying that it's startups that are working or technology that is working to sell to government. Um, and I, we always try to break down that misconception that all startups are selling to government in urban tech. That's not true at all. Actually, I think only 20% of our portfolio sells directly to government. Um, and a large portion either do direct to consumer, you know, B to C, B to B, B to B. Can you say what those? Uh, those oh, sorry. Stand for um, 
uh, like business to business um, or business to consumer as opposed to selling to government. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of reasons why that is. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that's the makeup of our portfolio. A lot of it is in a venture capital world, you have to get returns and a lot of times selling to government or an idea is that selling to government is slow um, and just harder to get through and long sales cycles, yada, yada, yada. My idea is, you know, my personal opinion is selling to government is wonderful because they're a sticky customer and once you're in, you're in. But um, so, you know, I think f for us, it's just thinking about all the different verticals that I just talked about, food, water, waste, energy, transportation, and how you can sort of use technology to um, either make those areas more efficient or um, completely disrupt what is already existing. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of the philosophy that we take. For us, you know, when we think about sort of impact in urban tech, for us, we're not impact investors, we're mission aligned. Um, you know, so impact meaning like we don't, unfortunately, we don't actually care about like if we're taking away jobs or creating jobs, which is unfortunate, but that's sort of the distinction I like to make. But for us, we want to see positive impact in about 100 cities in five years and that's sort of how we think of like can this technology scale to a hundred cities in about five years through all of the b2b b2c b2g all of those different areas anyone else have um anything to add or subtract from from liz's overview of of what urban technology is yeah i mean i'd add because I, I had this conversation recently with somebody and i the way that was helpful for me to think about it. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's so many definitions of what can be urban tech, but it is a technology that has a, a significant impact or an impact on our experience of a city. Um, so for example, I would classify like Uber as urban tech because it has fundamentally changed the way that we commute or that we travel in cities. Um, I would probably classify like Airbnb as urban tech because it fundamentally changes the way that you know I travel and experience with new cities. I would also classify like a smart water meter as urban tech, even though I personally might never interact with it, but it is fundamentally changing something about services in, in a city. Um, now, yeah, I think that's just, that's one way of thinking about it as well. Um, and I agree just to underscore um, that comment that most urban tech startups don't actually sell to government. We're one of the rare companies that sells directly to government. And even when we speak with fund, venture funds or anything that focus on gov tech or urban tech, it's still, it's very clear to us every time that the fact that we sell to government is like an asterisk next to the company. It's not mm -hmm. normal for the entire um, kind of their portfolio or anything. Yeah, and I think this idea of who is the customer um, is, is a critical one. And I think, again, to kind of represent the bias and the perspectives of those on the panel, um, I think do all four of us here representing startups uh, work at companies that are primarily B2G um, selling to government? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's, it's, it, as Liz, this you pointed out, that's only 20% of your yeah, portfolio yeah. that you consider urban tech. I mean, I would say that... The majority, if you were to look at all urban techs, if they're venture backed or not, I would say a lot of them do sell the government and like the idea of like disrupting government or helping government um, is critical. Um, but the venture backed world is much more limited for the reasons I said in that VCs fundamentally either don't understand government, don't understand procurement, they don't understand pilots, they don't understand how these things work. Therefore, they're afraid of it. Therefore, they won't invest in it. I mean, at the end of the day, VC gets your money from limited partners and you have to pay back your limited partners. So you have to think about like, can this actually, you know, be a major win? Can this make me a ton of money? I think that narrative is shifting because there have been some startups that are sort of breaking down those, those stereotypes. And, um, and I think investors as sort of climate tech, so, you know, making that as like a part of urban tech, I think um, technology that is helping combat climate change is you know, a lot of corporates and a lot of banks are coming out and saying like there is an economic opportunity when it comes to climate tech. So I do think over time those barriers have been broken down. So I think people will be more open to it, but there is still that sort of the um, hesitation to work with government. So as we think about what urban tech is, I next want to think about what is the opportunity presented um, by urban tech? So what are, what are the potential benefits here? Um, 
you know, for one, there's money coming into um, urban communities in a different kind of way. Uh, there's a financial vehicle through which um, urban challenges are trying to be addressed. Um, and so I guess I have this question of does the rising tide of more money in, in, the, in, in the ecosystem, does that lift all ships, including the ship of, of city government? Um, or does more money mean the pace of urban, and does more money mean the pace of urban innovation is faster in, in, in the context of a startup than it can be in government? Um, and is there more opportunity for different kinds of impact um, when facing big public challenges um, in a startup than in government? Or what is the distinction between the kinds of opportunity for impact that might exist? I'm happy to jump in. I, I mean, I no, I don't think that it rises all ships. I think a lot of this technology is for people that are have access to technology anyways. Um, I would say marginalized communities are completely left out of the conversation when it comes to urban tech, frankly. And I think a lot of that is because of venture capital and how it's fundamentally flawed. Um, shitting on my own industry, <laughs> but um, policy wonk first, VC second. Um, so, you know, just to be completely honest, I don't think that it's there yet. I, I hope that it will get there. And I think if, you know, if government was, um, you know, more of, let's say, an investor or made uh, it easier to work with government with a lot of technology, I do think that it would be more beneficial to more communities. But right now, no, I don't think so. Okay, so we have kind of the opening salvo, <laughs> a cynical view. Yeah. Um, and all of us here do, do this work, presumably at least in part, because we're trying to do good in the world. Um, what kind of good are we able to do in the world, um, given, given the types of organizations we work for? I have some. Um, I'll, I'll take the optimist view for a moment. Um, you know, part of my portfolio um, when I worked for city government was our IT department. Um, and there's a lot of challenges to doing IT work in government. Um, there are rec recruitment and retention challenges. There's um, a lot of different stakeholders who control um, how developers may develop, um, what kinds of standards they have to go through. Um, they're dealing with a lot of legacy systems that um, are very hard to get rid of and budgetary quirks that would like blow your mind. So. Um, so I think, I think it's um, very hard uh, in government to um, develop, um, develop quickly and, to de and, um, and, that, and so I think that is a place where, um, where private sector like software products um, can, can come in and do something that um, is difficult for, um, for government to do directly. Um, I think government is, is rightfully and naturally skeptical at times because they have had traumatic experiences with, with getting kind of stuck with vendors um, who did not perform well. And so there is this kind of skepticism that there's, it, it looks intriguing, but, but what is this gonna mean in, in two years? Are you gonna jack up my prices? Or, um, or, you know, or are you even going to exist if it's a, if it's a startup? So I think there's, um, there's a lot of opportunity to, to provide tools to planners that they don't have today, and but but getting them in their hands um, is a challenge. And actually, building on that, I'd love it if you could maybe point to some of your your work at Court. I, I'm thinking in particular about um, the surveil tool and cities that, that maybe are mapping their and digitizing curb regulations um, that might not have done that were it not for the existence of, of Court. Right. Um, Something um, I, I learned was that very, very few cities have a digital map of what their curb space looks like. Um, and then maybe they have um, a database of signs, but translate that, translating that into quantifiable information to say in, in this area, I have this much space devoted to this use um, is something that is actually um, quite a hard programming task. Um, to do, and and then next step to you know communicate at, that out to drivers and mobility companies by an API is something that you know um, just didn't didn't really exist. So, um, but you know, it's certainly something um, planners are very interested in knowing more about. Um, so, I guess that's that's kind of um, 
that's the you know one of the big pieces of value we bring is that there are there are these developers who are able to work very quickly. Um, if they need to buy a thing, they buy it like that to add to the, what they're doing. It's just like they're just able to do things differently to build a tool that ultimately um, makes it easier for planners to, to do their job. And speaking of making it easier for planners to do their job, uh, Matt, I know that's a big part of Matthew. I know that's a big part of what you focus on at Remix. Um, do you want? Can do you have anything to add to kind of the opportunities that being able to provide a, a software as a service product um, to your government employees, uh, like? How do you think about the impact that you're able to have? Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is <clears throat> in planning, as in any space where you have practitioners or specialists in what they do and really understand the landscape and know how to make decisions and understand the impacts, they're not necessarily going to be experts in computer programming. And I think that's a reality for government, for private companies. And so really the opportunity from a technology perspective is that um, you know, tech is really good at building software. And so there's an opportunity to really support um, governments from the perspective of they're just not going to have the time or the or the resources to build the sort of programs that people who focus on those sorts of things um, can do and I think that's really where a company like remix comes in where um, you know we really focus on building tools that are extremely specific to the work of transportation planners and we really um, you know go to painstaking lengths to understand and empathize with with what they do um, so that way our product uh, reflects what their actual needs are. Um, and I think that's a real key to sort of being supportive from a private sector perspective uh, for, for governments. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I personally find that this, I mean, I think that uh, the issue you raised, Liz, of, of you know, who, who, who gets to decide, who gets to participate, who benefits. You, can I explain my uh, cynicism maybe a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, no, no because I think this question of yeah. equity and access, uh, particularly when we're talking about urban technology, yeah. um, is, is a critical one. Um, so yeah, if you have additional thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, if you look at where the money is going right now, which that is one indicator, right? But I'm just going to say like where a lot of VC money is going. And a lot of it, let's say, is going to like um, solving housing issues, right? So a lot of like construction tech is huge right now. And like... You talk to a lot of people that are building construction technology, they will actually use the narrative that by saving money for these, const you know, these construction companies, these developers, that it'll make housing cheaper. And I think that is, to me, like a fundamental narrative flaw to say that because you're saving construction companies or developers money that people can, A, have access to that housing and that it's making it cheaper for them. Um, and I think that's sort of what I mean by like, who is this actually benefiting? You know, the story that you're telling versus who is ultimately benefiting. Absolutely, aspects of Civ and GovTech are wonderful when it comes to fundamental government, but I think um, the other side of it, sort of going back to my earlier statement of like B2B, B2C versus B2G, I think a lot of the B2B, B2C is yet to sort of trickle down in using that loosely, but you know, sort of like, who is this really benefiting? Um, so that's sort of where, you know, from my point of view, who I'm seeing, um, who we're potentially investing in. I mean. Another big part of it is like surveillance and, and, and fi facial recognition, which is a huge part of the, the conversation. Um, you know, who is that benefiting? Who is that hurting? You know, there's a lot of VCs that don't have that conversation of like, you put facial recognition out there, like, who's that hurting? You know, they think of it as like selling to law enforcement, we're going to solve so much crime, but they don't understand like social justice issues or racial issues in cities. So. I'm just thinking of it, you know, from a VC policy perspective that a lot of times this technology could also be hurtful in addition to being beneficial for some people. Yeah, absolutely. And I, Nusha, I would love to hear your thoughts on this idea of, um, of kind of data collection and surveillance of vulnerable populations. Obviously, um, I, I, it's hard to imagine a, a, a type of data collection that feels um, maybe, maybe more invasive to folks than something like collecting human, human waste data. Um, <laughs> How do you navigate that narrative, or how, how do you work with government in a way that assuages any concerns around PII, um, around uh, surveillance and surveillance capitalism? Yeah, um, so that's a huge topic. Um, just before I get into it, I just want to add that you know I think you're absolutely right where you're saying that we still have to figure out how a lot of these like B2B and B2C urban tech companies are actually trickling up and benefiting the entire society. So for example, take Uber, again, going back to Uber, it's an urban tech 
you can classify that as urban tech, but who is, or which economy is Uber really benefiting? Is it benefiting the city as a whole? I mean, there's studies now that show that public transportation is not being used as frequently as it used to, and it's being replaced actually by Uber. Well, what does that do when you look at emissions and things like that? So um, it might be benefiting certain individuals and making their transportation costs cheaper and more accessible, but as a whole, um, yeah, there's still a lot to, to be seen. There. I think that's such an important point, and I think it, it, it really ties into what you were saying, Liz, about this idea of narrative mm -hmm. and being skeptical of the narrative um, that's being told um, and who's telling it and, and why they're telling it. Um, certainly with, with, with TNCs, there was a, a, a narrative and a claim even that, hey, we're going to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled, we're going to reduce the, the number uh, of cars on the road, we are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and um, Don, I'm gonna I'm gonna table it, but we're gonna come back to you later because I do want to hear from Nusha about um, collection of, <laughs> of human waste data. Um, but but this idea that you know how do you, how does the government or how do we uh, collectively as all those multilateral actors in the city how do we scrutinize those messages um, and bring something like empirical evidence to test a claim like that and say actually um, that's the opposite of what we're seeing on New York City streets. Anyway. Yeah, so when we first started or when we first launched um, Biobot, we, we, want, we knew for sure that we wanted our first product to um, be for government. And we wanted to sell to government and we wanted to work directly with municipal government. Why? Because, well, first of all, that was kind of the thesis that the entire company was founded on, like to better urban environments, but also government controls access to wastewater infrastructure. And we knew that if we wanted to maintain that access, we sort of needed to um, build a product that they were on board with. So we asked you know, as many government officials and public health officials as we could, you know, what's your biggest public health concern? If I can give you any sort of human health data to make your job easier, what is it that you care about? And across the board, we got um, information on the opioid epidemic or opioid drug consumption, heroin consumption, prescription opioid medication consumption. Um, public health departments in the US are spending 80 to 90% of their time working on this, specific, like only this one issue with like 10 to 20% of their time working on all the other public health issues. So there was a lot of, we found that there was need for a lot of um, support there. And when we started digging more and more into sort of the data that they currently use to guide a lot of their opioid response strategies, we found that there was this clear gap in the data. Um, we found that the data, first of all, was really only looking at overdose deaths. So at that point, you know, it's a, it's a little too late. So you're solving yesterday's problem today. So that's how geographically, I mean, at best, they would spatially map overdose deaths and then deploy, you know, let's say if it's, heroin deaths, then they're like, let's deploy needle exchange units. If it's prescription opioid deaths, then let's deploy educational programs, et cetera. We also found that overdose deaths represent less than 1% of individuals who suffer from substance use disorder and that they tend to skew towards low-income transient, low-income populations, transient communities like homeless, homeless people. And so that had become sort of the face of the opioid epidemic because the data was limited and more sort of focus on that group of individuals. Whereas we found that wastewater presented this opportunity to actually be very democratic in its assessment of you know, who is actually the population that is consuming um, illicit drugs or prescription opioids and can use help or support um, and benefit from a lot of these government services because it might not actually kind of overlap perfectly with what we're seeing with the overdose deaths. Um, so that was our hypothesis going into it, and when we launched with our first city customer, that was exactly what we saw, that the heat map that we were able to put in front of them was completely different from the heat map that they had that looked at the overdose death clusters. Um, as a result, the city sort of reevaluated all of their opioid response outreach um, based on this kind of new heat map of consumption that they saw, uh, because number one, those people are still alive in the heat map that we're putting in front of them. Um, and they, you know, geographically were targeting their response more. In this one city, for example, it was prescription opioids we were able to tell them was, was the big problem. And so they sort of scrapped all of their 
heroin um, educational campaigns and needle exchange programs and focused everything on educational campaigns around prescription opioids and setting up prescription medication drop-off units. And in that kind of six-month period of time that we ran our pilot with them, they had three times as much engagement with the city services as they had previously, because previously, again, they were getting a lot, there was a lot of like nimbyism in the community, you know, this isn't our problem, this is homeless people coming from the city next door, that big city over there that are overdosing here. Um, so from us, you know, we see it really fundamentally, this perspective that, you know, sewage is democratic. Everybody contributes to it. It doesn't matter how much money you have, your voice is not like, you know, bigger, your voice isn't louder in wastewater because your house is bigger. Um, and, or, you know, we, we essentially can provide the same services to everybody in every part of the city, um, regardless of what zip code people live in. Now, when it comes to issues of privacy, um, number one, it's, it's been very important for us to spend quite a bit of time, like, educating government or the public health departments that we're working with on the technology that we're using and the limits of the technology, so what it can do and what it can't do. Um, so for example, telling them that the data that we're generating is de-aggregated. It's, it can't be de-aggregated anymore. So it's, it's um, kind of inherently aggregated and anonymized. You can't, if we're collecting, you know, liters and liters of sewage that represent 25,000 people, there's absolutely no way to then de-identify that um, and be able to kind of understand this is coming from X person or X building or X household. Um, number two, you know, things like that people don't know that I didn't know until um, we kind of got into it, but less than 1% of DNA that you find in sewage is actually human DNA. 99.9% .9 of the DNA is DNA coming from plants, bacteria, other animals, et cetera. Um, so even that like human information is so small. And then obviously we have like, you know, pages and pages of contracts that stipulate that we destroy all human DNA, that we, you know, we don't even look at it. Um, as a company, we don't sample sites that represent fewer than 10,000 people to kind of maintain that level of aggregation. Um, and I guess it's always important for us to go back to that initial sort of mission of ours, which is to leverage our data to disrupt public health. And public health really operates at that community level. Public health is not about providing services to one specific household or one street. It's really about that um, kind of community scale. And so as long as we remember that, then we're always kind of designing our our service and the data that we're generating around that. I think that was a really helpful deep dive into um both what you do and, and some of the challenges you, you think through with respect to, to privacy. Um, and I think kind of there's this great opportunity to serve and support um, public health and epidemiology. Um, I'm curious, you talked about thinking long and hard about uh, you know, how you protect uh, PII, those types of commitments you made. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what that process was. I'm curious, do, do you work with police departments? Mm -hmm. um, have you considered it? Yeah. Um, would you work with the DEA if they were interested in seeing where are people using narcotics? Yeah. So when we first started, we were really nervous about even talking to police departments. Um, I think we just, we also didn't really understand what police officers and what police departments do. I think that was the problem. And I think most people probably don't really understand. Um, and you just assume that it's law enforcement, incarcer like pushing incarceration, et cetera. What we actually found, found out, because um, we resisted reaching out to police departments or talking to police departments, and organically our first customer involved their police chief and their police department at one of the early meetings. And we actually found out that police departments across the US have become de facto sort of um, social workers. Most municipalities in the US don't have public health departments, and so it's been the police departments and fire departments um, to some extent that have taken on the burden of responding as social workers to the opioid epidemic. So um, not uh, arresting people or convicting individuals of drug use, but rather checking up on overdose victims like a day later, a week later, encouraging them to enroll in therapy, et cetera. Um, so when the police departments first started showing up at the table when like a mayor's office would bring them in, um, we were a little skittish, but then they made it very clear that they weren't really interested in our data, that 
Um, you know, they kind of know, they know what's happening where um, in terms of overdoses, like the overdose data is available and they're really only focused on that overdose community, not the consumption community. And so it just turned out, we discovered after a while that there just like wasn't really a, a need for us to work together. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, from my own experience, um, I remember uh, it was kind of uh, data from the, the police department that, that kind of caused my mayor uh, to work with the fire department and, and every member of the um, the EMS and, and fire firefighters uh, had Narcan on them mm -hmm. in certain areas exactly. as a result, essentially, of, of that back in time map that you yeah. described. Mm -hmm. um, so, kind of this idea that there are multiple roles that are played by those departments, but you know, I think um, it, it is an ongoing challenge. Like, who who's going to use data is itself is neutral, um, and we can't always foresee the ways it's going to be used. And so, this is certainly a challenge. Um, face not not just in the public sector, but in particular in in the private startup world, where there might be a lot more incentives to collect a lot of different types of data that haven't been introduced in the context of city hall, where things might be foyable um, yeah. and and might move um, but from department to department. Mm -hmm. um, I I do want to get back to this idea of. Um, of the narratives told, and I, I don't know if there's anything you want to share on that issue we tabled earlier, Don, about um, kind of your experience pushing back against a narrative of public benefit from TNCs. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think um, they entered communities with a lot of claims about positive impacts they would bring. Um, some of them, I think, are true. Like, I think that they have made a positive impact on drunk driving. Um, you know, but there's a lot of a lot of claims they made without a lot of backing. Um, you know, things like re you know, like we we're talking about in reducing emissions, reducing car ownership, um, being supportive of transit, um, and that you know, data now that it's increasingly becoming available is is showing they aren't true. So I, I think as people who are you know, maybe considering careers or just, you know, kind of interested citizens, I, I think you just remember, like, mission statements are cheap, and most people, most people don't, like, fact check the claims of these companies with the kind of vigor that government is typically fact check when they make such a claim. Um, so really think about, like, the source of it, what do they actually have to back that up, why are, why are, there, why are they saying it? Um, and did you and ask for data uh, when you were in the, on, the, on the city side? Yeah, so, um, so that's, a, that's a really big piece of this and maybe a good example. Um, so so we, um, we, we created regulations to require data reporting. Um, and I, I'm a little bit like, I'm uh, specific on my, my semantics because I think a lot of the companies use the term data sharing as if it's like, nice, like I should share with you, but it's up to me. The share gives, I have a three-year-old and you try to tell them the share gives, but, but it's, if this, is, if this is transportation data about who's using the streets and it's impacting all of us, I, I don't think it's about sharing. I think, I think they should be required to report data to the government. Um, you know, New York City, like I said, um, had a very, um, you know, good starting position that we already had strong regulatory power. Um, most most um, most cities did not, and in fact, these companies went state to state to state and got state legislation passed to preempt cities and take away their power to regulate or to get data reporting. Um, and as we were um, rolling out our data reporting requirements, um, the companies fought back um, really hard, and all of a sudden, they were like the defenders of privacy in America. <laughs> and they, you know, had made, you know, made friends with, made donations with, got Jano on the board of a lot of convenient organizations who were rolled out to then speak on their behalf um, about privacy issues um, and to kind of, um, without specifically lying, hint that we were asking for things and doing things for things that just weren't true. Um, and so I think that's one of those examples when, um, when there is a company coming out with some kind of strong social position that they're the defender of your privacy, think about why they're saying that. I, they're, they are mostly concerned about 
um, their, their competition and how, how their competition can view or not view how, what they're doing. And so it was really a, a business concern was what was really driving that activity rather than a concern um, for individuals' privacy. And just Google it, there's a lot of evidence of the ways that, that, that those companies internally were certainly not protecting privacy. Um, so I think just be a skeptical consumer of, um, of claims made by companies and think about who's, who's their real Who's their real customer? What's their real incentive? Um, are are folks like, on the panel and in the room familiar with the mobility data specification or the current um, legal battle between Los Angeles and, and Uber around essentially this, this very question of what needs to be reported? Folks familiar? Does someone, someone on the panel want to explain what's going on with, with the mobility data specification? I can talk about it. Oh, yeah, basically, from, about from, from very high level, um, the city or LA DOT would like to basically have unlimited access to Uber's data, um, essentially be able to manage mobility in real time. Um, and so, not unlimited. Yes, but <laughs> sort of like the, but have pretty much you know a lot of control over sort of that information. And so they're kind of sparring with each other in terms of who um, who should have access to that information. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll add a little bit. Uh, so Stay does is a data partner to a few cities that have um, e-scooter programs. Um, and so the mobility data specification is a standard by which um, data reporting is required of operators if you don't have them in, maybe in the outer perch, we don't have them in New York yet, right? Um, but e-scooters um, have been rolled out in a number of cities as a, obviously as a, as a shared micro-mobility um, service. And in many cities, uh, the permit requires a certain level of data sharing. Um, and so kind of there, there's a very interesting back and forth right now between, again, kind of the privacy world uh, that's very concerned about the idea of government having access to um, trip, trip path data from an origin along the, the, the urban grid to a destination with timestamps at each location. Um, you know, all of this is anonymized, but uh, uh, a specific location and timestamp is uniquely identifiable, if not personally identifiable, um, versus uh, governments that have are, are, are working on use cases that they say are really valuable um, for using this type of information. Um, for instance, one use case that we support uh, in the city of Louisville, Kentucky at Stay, their permit requires that a certain amount, a certain percentage of that fleet of vehicles be um, what's called rebalanced, dropped off in the morning in uh, lower income communities in, in West Louisville. And so they have this permit requirement, but how on, how on earth could it have any teeth if they cannot see in real time have the vehicles been dropped off in those neighborhoods? Um, and so helping to kind of build the infrastructure and the tools for government to get an alert, okay, this is the percentage of the fleet that's in this neighborhood at this time, um, and that make that recurring so that if, if anything's amiss, James in Louisville can call up Bird and say, hey, uh, we're going to dock you for this, or hey, this is, do this better next time. That's, you know, that's, that's the interplay that often needs to happen and that sometimes can't happen um, without something like um, data sharing or data reporting, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, and I, and I think just to add, like, I call like, the avoidance of data reporting the long game for the avoidance of regulation. Because if the government doesn't have the data to monitor what's going on or to, to, or to even do a study of how much are Uber drivers actually making, are they making the fortunes you promised them, then those things can, not, cannot be really regulated. I mean, you, if you don't have the data to know that I'm letting drivers drive 14 hours straight, then how can you set a regulation stopping me? So it's really, it's really about a lot more than the data. It's about the avoidance of, of regulation altogether. Yeah. And because if you, if you make a regulation without the study, they sue you and say you didn't have enough information to make that regulation. <laughs> so, so without it, you're kind of in this, you're stuck. And, but that's advantageous to companies that don't wish to be regulated. Yeah, we could have a whole panel just on kind of the, the, the data component uh, of, of this um, potential for collaboration or antagonism between startups and government. 
I mean, I think a lot of times the question comes back to like, why do these startups do this? Like, of course there's like that they need to like grow fast and like break things and whatever. But I think a lot of it, you do have to follow the money, right? Like if these startups have huge injections by SoftBank and their expectation is to grow like enormously in the next like year, they make bad decisions. And so your suggestion for people to like look at mission statements, I would say also look at who's giving them money and sort of their expectations for growth. Um, I think we have this expectation that like if you have a lot of money, you have to go really fast, you have to break things. But I think going back to like who that helps and who that hurts is like really important. So if you're going to start a, start a startup or if you're going to join a startup in the urban tech space, I just encourage folks to look at, like follow the money, see who the investors are, look at who their LPs are and how that impacts decision making on the startups level. Well, despite my impassioned plea at the start of the conversation, um, we, we haven't had much audience participation yet, so I do want to open it up. How, how are we doing on time, Ufe? Um, we have, um, we've given about five minutes, so it's like, mm -hmm. but we can continue the conversation. Great. Um, so I really do want to open it up to the audience um, to get folks uh, to bring their own experiences to this conversation. When you said about participation, I thought format matters. Yes. And it just reminded me of the last comment in that regulations, how do we, how can we regulate something we don't know? And taxis and cars and housing have been regulated for centuries without big data, right? And whether that be through network, county hall, financialist things, pushing back and arguing for people, groups of people organizing. And so how precisely how can you all in the sector identify and communicate the biases that using data as a form of participation effectively, as a form of voice, um, has inherent in the structure of, 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 of the mode? Yeah, I think that's a great overarching question for a lot of these conversations. Um, what are the inherent uh, flaws and problematics of working with data. What do we miss when we take a data-driven approach? Uh, and sorry, to rephrase. Yeah, not, not necessarily the flaws. I don't want to say that everything is lost by it. Sure. I mean, there have been so many examples of things that are picked up. But the way things work is often just as important as what they do. Right? Sure. What responsibility is, uh, can you take in the private sector working how it works, or is that unrealistic? Is that not company's job? Mm -hmm. So just to, um, like, so we're sort of in this position right now, and I liked your point that, you know, things like cars and transportation, et cetera, have been regulated for a very, very long time, decades and decades. We've had regulation around these things. Um, wastewater data is not regulated. So we work in a space that, you know, people ask us a lot, like, who owns sewage. Does the city own it? Do the people who it has come from at some point own it? Do they own it when it's in the pipes on their street? At what point do they lose ownership? Like none of these questions have ever been talked about or um, worked on. So we're really the first and we recognize that and one thing that we're doing is that we want to lead these conversations and actually um, bring them up to regulators, both within, let's say, like state we're working with, a couple states at the state legislation um, level, and then also in the federal government. And so how that's, what that process has looked like for us for the past year has been this huge education component of educating government officials on, you know, what this data is, what it looks like, what it can tell us, what it can't tell us, you know, how we get it, where we get it from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then encourage them to start thinking about inevitable regulation of this information because today BioBox is the only company doing this. But if we are successful in demonstrating the value of this data, specifically the monetary value of this data, like we're not going to be the only company doing this for much longer. And you know, we would like to think that um, we're mission driven and that we want to build a product that's for public good, but the next company that's looking at wastewater data might not. Um, so on our side, that's sort of what it looks like. Um, you know, we actually 
think about this question a lot. What more can we be doing or what else can we be doing to kind of think about regulation? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if this directly gets at your question, but I think um, this idea of metadata and kind of documentation is key. Mm -hmm. um, I know that one of the things that we, um, for example, we work with a few different local governments, including the state of Rhode Island Department of Transportation, to help them um, work with data from Waze. Um, and that's a data source coming from a third party that's crowdsourced. And that's very different from the official source of data um, coming from the, the, the traffic management team that's keeping track of accidents on state highways. Um, and so when we bring that data into the same system and we're integrating it and standardizing it on, on, on the same schema, it's really important to have that prominence of where did this data come from, how was it collected, what does it mean, what does it not mean. Um, and so I think one of the big things that, uh, I think the good news about working with government as a, as a client is that they have a built-in incentive to care about a lot of those things too. They don't always have the resources um, to employ best practices. Um, but that's kind of been an incentive of ours. We've heard a lot of, of um, desire from our government clients to have better tools for keeping track and documenting where did this data come from, at what points has it been transformed, why was it transformed in that way, how was it collected originally, um, and to have that kind of natively in, in the product. Yeah, I, um, a like piece of feedback that I hear from cities is that you know they have companies come to them with some kind of like data or tool, but for like proprietary reasons, like they don't want to like pull you know pull back the curtain and tell the city the methods um, that they used. Um, but that's very hard for a government person to make use of that because the, the people to whom they are accountable, whether it's their boss or the community meeting, like rightfully want to understand the methods behind the analysis that they're being asked to make decisions on. Um, and so I, I, I understand certain companies might have their reasons where they like that, but it's definitely an impediment to them getting um, certain cities, probably especially larger, more sophisticated cities, um, to, to, to kind of sign on. Um, I mean, and, and personally, like that's, that's feedback I've given to my team where sometimes they feel like, um, like our, our product development team, sometimes they feel like, um, you know, we have, we have good defaults, um, you know, we're going to avoid the fire hydrant and avoid the bench. I'm like, what does that mean? And, and how can the city person know exactly what that means and change it if that's not exactly what they want to do? And you don't want like a spaghetti software where there's like a setting for everything, but I think for, for settings that impact the planner's ability to explain her methodology, like that's kind of complexity well spent also say that cities have been collecting their own data for a very long time. Um, and so one of the things that we do at Remix is we really just try and take the data sets that cities spend a lot of time collecting already, whether it's demographic or information, traffic counts, turning movement counts, all that sort of stuff they, they, they'll collect. And we really just try and help them visualize it in a way that's more meaningful to, to really just draw conclusions a little bit more quickly and help tell a narrative around, you know, why they're doing the things that they're doing. So, you know, I think we've had a lot of conversations about a lot of this new data coming in, um, but there's also been data being collected for, um, you know, for the longest time, and cities also need help with getting that and making it um, more accessible as well. Other comments, questions, yeah. stories from the audience? Juan? Can I get you all to say sort of where do you see uh, urban tech going? Besides the, the fully optimistic point of view, like that was totally valid, but also the sort of the dangers of it and, and what problems might uh, sort of your your envisioning that will, will come up? Uh, my biggest thing is sort of um, surveillance and facial recognition that scares the shit out of me. I mean, I think. Um, we see so many startups that are interested in this space and have really cool technology that is so freakishly accurate as, to, as far as like identifying criminals, let's say, um, how you want to define criminals, but um, that freaks me out. And it's been a big thing on our team. Like I am so much, I'm so deeply against it, um, but there's a lot of people that see um, the benefits of it I will also say that this is where the sort of like selling to government or not selling to government comes in as well. Like 
there are a lot of startups that say, well, I don't want to sell this to law enforcement. I'll sell this to Disney. I'll just have Disney. Like, and so then it becomes, talk about data, then it's like, okay, you're talking about a private sector owning all this data. They're, they're scraping the entire internet, Facebook, Instagram, wherever. Like, that's, the, that's what freaks me out. Um, the Daily had a really good episode on this, actually, I think last week or whatever. So, um, and that's urban tech. Right? Um, so then it becomes into a whole security, public health thing. That freaks me out. That's an area I would like to, frankly, just stay away from and someone to say, absolutely not, we cannot do this, but it's already there. It's already happening. So basically, what are we going to do about it? You know, I think building on that idea of it's already there, um, I think one of the problems and concerns that, that we think a lot about is. Um, in a way similar to what you were describing, Matthew, we are often helping governments work with um, data systems they already have. Um, but increasingly, we're kind of seeing this, um, and we're also, try, again, trying to empower government to be more of a counterbalance to um, large surveillance capitalist uh, firms that are now operating in cities or in the public realm in certain ways um, as, a, as a countervailing force. Um, but uh, I often see there's kind of this uh, almost like impossible choice. I don't think, I don't know if you, you read the New York Times' privacy series um, or on personal location data, for instance. You know, I don't think we all got together and consented to the creation of a massive repository of everyone's personal movements and visits um, to various establishments. And we're, we kind of, but it's there. It exists in the world. Um, and you can buy it from a data broker. And, and so we kind of have this choice of, uh, government, I think, has this choice of, do we participate in this? You know, if, we, if this is going to exist, is the highest and best use of it, to use a term from planning, to cite the next Panera Bread, or is it to solve a public health challenge? So given that it exists, should we participate and use it, even though we have moral misgivings about its existence in the first place? Um, or, or can we put our head in the sand and, and kind of pretend it doesn't and let that asymmetry between um, the expertise about urban space that the private sector has continue to grow um, and that gap continue to widen between um, the private sector and those that are supposed to be keeping the private sector in check. Um, and I don't know how to solve that problem, so that's what keeps me awake at night. I think, sorry. I think the government actually really wants to like participate in all these new technologies. Like, they're actually very like interested in the facial recognition technologies or like the cell phone data that tracks your mobility, the technologies, if they only had had the like the, the information and the resources to, to use them properly. I think that like there's actually like a lot more enthusiasm than uh, that that you would expect or want from the government and that's something that's kind of yeah, it's interesting. I think we see a lot of variance, uh, I think, sometimes tracking the level of government and jurisdiction, sometimes just place to place. The city of Austin, for instance, doesn't, um, they could require the Sherry MDS data, but they don't, they do not collect any um, individualized paths of scooter movements in the city. And that's because they have that commitment to, like, kind of limit what they can see. And I found that to be very interesting. Can um, I answer your, op like, the opposite side, what I'm excited about, yeah. though? I'm super excited about a lot of energy startups um, and also uh, micro mobility. I, I mean, I would say, like, talking about climate change, there are some really cool companies out there that are helping buildings reduce emissions. And, like, there is some cool stuff out there. So, even though I feel like I'm being extremely pessimistic on this panel, I, there is a lot of cool stuff that I'm excited about, specifically in energy and transportation. Okay, we said something to get folks interested. <laughs> no, um, uh, I want to ask something that's. It's Somewhat tangentially related to actually, uh, we've talked a lot, a lot about uh, data sharing and how this goes around, and this is kind of the, the somewhat related question of the, the consent to it. And I feel this is like a, a particularly difficult question in, in urban areas. People travel around and they ask for a place or something. There's data that's being collected about them that they have no idea about or whatnot. Like you enter Google's New Smart City, they ever built in Toronto. Like, how, what do you guys think is, is the path forward for, for dealing with questions about consent uh, to a lot of these, these kind of data collection questions. And especially informing people about it or, or whatnot. I have some thoughts, but I don't have any immediate reactions to consent, informed consent, consent in public space, collection of data not in public space. Great keywords, consent better. 
I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer, but I think something we, we might not have a complete consensus on that makes it hard is, is like where do we have an assumption of privacy, right? Like thinking back to like my criminal justice class, like where, like when you're in an Uber, like do you assume that is a private space or not? Um, and I, I don't think we've figured out um, like on the street, you know, like should you assume your conversation or your face is private or not? And, and I think that informs what types of rules we want to put in place. But I, we, don't, we can't assume everywhere is private, but, may, but, I don't, but maybe it, we want more privacy than we feel we have today. Um, if you even uh, decide on, on uh, what consent or what, what is a private space, which obviously is a way too big question. Right, like there's case law, like there's case law to some point yeah. on that, but it's gotten more complicated than, than it was before. But there were a lot of these cases early with like whether you could use heat sensing guns to detect someone growing plants in their house and whether there was an assumption, you know, like how far could you go um, on that like assumption of privacy in a home or a car and things like that. I'll give one example I think that uh, is a complication of, of around kind of consent in, in public versus private and then maybe uh, speak to one, without endorsing, but uh, speak to one example I know of an attempt to kind of address some of the issues that you're describing that actually comes from the Keyside Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto. Um, so the first is when, you know, when I was a transparency advocate at the Sunlight Foundation, um, you know, we were very much on the side of, uh, when you are in public space, like say you take a photo, like we were used to police officers, for instance, saying, hey, you're not allowed to take a photo of us in public space and saying, Actually, the law says public space, there's an expectation uh, that your image can be captured. Um, and now there's a lot of discussion around, okay, that was one policy regime in a world that predated facial recognition. Is this still the regime that's relevant um, to our conception of what we mean by our, it's okay for your image to be captured? Um, but I think this idea that like, privacy, who can privacy benefit? When does privacy benefit those with more power? When does it benefit those with less power. I, I think a lot about this idea of surveillance, um, surveillance from the bottom up, uh, bottom up uh, access to information versus surveillance, and when can urban tech maybe empower the former. Um, the other example I'll, I'll bring, I'm forgetting the exact acronym, but uh, maybe someone in the room knows. Um, there's an effort as part of the Keyside Project um, in, in Toronto to prototype and pilot a set of uh, iconography essentially almost like nutrition labels or warning labels to, uh, to complement uh, urban sensing. And so there are these kind of like hexagonal, the colors mean something, the symbols, there's symbology to it, and there's a digital and a physical component to it, but essentially the idea is wherever um, sensing technology is deployed in public space, how can we make sure that A, there's um, data about, metadata essentially about, okay, what type of sensor is this, what is it collecting, uh, is there a way, in what, in what ways is this data limited? Is it kept forever? Um, what, it, in, what is it used for? Um, as well as a, a digital, for, so, so, um, so that someone could query that data set as open data, um, as well as like a physical representation of that. Um, you know, something that, that someone might notice when they're walking across the sidewalk and there's a traffic cam on the light pole. I think it's called the digital public realm. Does anyone know? Actually, when Shannon and I were in conspiracy, we were talking about that iconography and how that kind of like gives you a false sense of like, oh, you know, a false sense of like transparency. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think we're at the early stages of this. I wonder if there, you know, we generally think of nutrition labels as a good thing and certain, you know, requirements around disclosure from the FDA. Um, but I, I wonder when they were first being developed if there was. Um, criticism of that as co-optation of the narrative and doing something small in order to placate. And I think that's the kind of conversation that's happening right now. Stephen, just kind of like in the interest of time, like maybe we should um, wrap this up. Yeah, good question. We'll have more, um, okay, let's, let's take yeah. one last burning question because I know you're waiting. And this will be kind of our final word. So, um, you know, whatever this gentleman says, just, you know, uh, employ your political skills to warp it into your, your closing statement. Sorry.
<laughs> I didn't know we were trying to uh, learn something. Last year, I would say we had a lot of frustration with urban techs and their uh, IPOs, like uh, WeWork, Uber, etc. Um, how this influenced your work, and how do you think it is influencing uh, the, the scenario? Great question. So IPOs, how how have IPOs that maybe not gone as well as expected influenced the context in which we all try to do our work? Great question. Um, I think it boils back down to like inflated valuation, really. It's like, what is the value of these companies? Um, again, back to my earlier comment about SoftBank writing big checks and what that does to companies. I actually think like growing slower with thoughtful, thoughtful VCs and being very intentional about like what you're actually building is great for startups. I think what it's done from for us and our investors is like, okay, wh how are you guys going to avoid like these messy exit strategies, right? Um, it's always the question like, when you invest in a startup, how are you going to make money off of it? Like, what does an exit strategy look like for these fine startups right here? Um, is it M and A? Is it you know IPO? So um, I think it created sort of like a household understanding of what urban tech is and what it can do. And like, I think a lot of people didn't originally associate like Airbnb and WeWork with like the name urban tech. So it did that, I guess, but there is still that negative connotation. But I think they're outliers. The majority of urban tech companies are doing really interesting and thoughtful things. And I think their exit strategy is to be determined. But um, from a VC perspective, we, yes, you should think about your exit strategy, but like also like focus on what you're building right now. So it's like, a um, I don't think I'm fully answering your question, but it's something that we consider, but it's also not dictating our everything because they're very specific soft bank circumstances in a lot of those companies. Yeah, I mean, I'd add for us, going back to your earlier point about also being mindful of like how, you know, let's say for me specifically as a company, how are we financed? Because a lot of those um, companies found themselves in those situations because they had these like growth metrics again, that were coming through from their investors or the type of capital that they chose to finance themselves with. Um, so how are we financing ourselves? And we've been so intentional about like slow, thoughtful growth. And it actually closed a, lo closed a lot of like VC doors to us because our growth metrics just weren't the same as you know, a traditional VC in Silicon Valley would expect of a startup. Um, you know, I'll always put Remix in a in its own category. I think Remix has been phenomenal, like has grown phenomenally well um, with metrics that are just like you know most tech companies that you see. But for us, it was very different. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's not public yet, and we're kind of in the last stages of closing around the financing right now. But our the lead investor that we're working with um, has patient capital, and what that means is their LPs don't expect a return within, I think it's 10 years typically or something. I, anyways, so their return kind of timeline is much longer and so they can invest in, um, you know, their fiduciary duty does not uh, preclude them from investing in companies that might have a longer time um, to, to return a profit. And one more point that I'll add is, you know, we did have an option at one point of just raising enough capital and self-funding deployments, for example, in let's say a dozen cities, whether or not they wanted us to do it, just we don't take any money from the city, we self-fund, we generate like a shitload of data, and then we go and sell that data, find, find you know, the highest buyer, the highest bidder for that data, and that was a path, but like we very deliberately did not want to take that path. Um, and so that, you know, slow growth is what, what we ended up with instead. I think also the typical VC structure is changing. I think people are more open to project finance and debt as well. That doesn't dilute your company and you can grow. Mm -hmm. For like a deployment, you can get someone to give you money instead of taking a fraction of your company. So I, I think mm -hmm. that sort of the traditional VC is changing. And I think a lot of it has to do with the IPOs that sort of blew up. Um, from, from the Remix perspective, I would say operationally it hasn't impacted us too much. I mean, the, the scale of like an Uber and Airbnb is just so many magnitudes larger than uh, what we do. Um, I would caveat that and say, you know, we were, we were fortunate that in the very beginning we found a, a really great product market fit. And some of that is just chance sometimes. Um, and so, you know, that's been a real boost for us in being able to go out and do 
other things we want to do. And then I would just say that um, you know it's really important that the people who are running the company and who report to these boards, you know, are are steadfastly aligned on on uh, the mission um, and really pushing back on some of the the growth metrics. And it's not an, it's not an easy thing to do because you know I spend uh, almost a decade in the financial world, and you know when people get into investments, it, it can tend to get lazy, and it, you really have to push back on sort of some of the the, the metrics and. Um, I think there are, are, are more VC companies that are willing to diversify their portfolios to have that. Um, you know, one big theme in finance that I saw was sort of sustainable investing, um, and it was a very, very small part of the financial world in terms of, in terms of the number of assets. But there were, there were financial firms using it as a vehicle for, uh, you know, CSR, PR for their companies. And so I do think there are opportunities for, um, you know, startups to find those kinds of companies who are willing to wait a, a little bit longer because um, there is a potential CSR impact for them down the line. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I have oh, one yeah. quick thing. I, I'm still kind of, I'm probably the most novice here in terms of like understanding the VC world and business, but you know, I was, I was considering opportunities in this, in this space, you know, six months ago and, and things I looked at, like just to see if they matched my comfort level were like, how many job postings did they have? Was it like a hundred or, or like 10? And that can kind of be an indicator of like the style and approach of, of the business. Also somewhat, to some extent, the phase that it's in, but, but that kind of thing can kind of help you see the style and figure out maybe whether they have fast money or slow money expectations and you can evaluate, do those seem realistic relative to you know the government or whoever they're trying to work with? Um, like, are you going to join a place that you think is naturally going to have butt heads or that's like planning to work at a pace that is, um, that's reasonable and compatible with, with their customers? All right. I think we'll close on that practical advice on, on how to <laughs> evaluate uh, urban tech startups you might consider working for. Um, so, so much to cover. So much was covered here today. Um, a lot. This is a conversation that I think it's important that all of us um, stay vigilant and not just having once, but continuing to have. Um, we could have talked about procurement, we could have had a whole panel on Keyside and Sidewalk Labs. Um, a lot, there's a lot to uncover here. Um, and a lot of this is so new that it's still being shaped in terms of how it fits in with regulation, with urban democracy. And I think all of you in this room, um, I think if we could give you a call to action, Get involved, um, whether, whether you're, you're making your voice heard on how you think this, the future of, of cities should look, um, whether it's working for an urban start, uh, tech startup, whether it's working for a city that's navigating this, this brave new world. Um, so thank you all for coming out, and I think we're going to stick around. Yeah.